You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a bit better put on a rope. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it in a chip with a key. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the first part of What If Deku Enters Godzilla Verse. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of GFAN97 on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Without power, can one become a hero? No, I should think not. It's been nearly 50 years now and I can still remember clear as day the first time I saw him. We're weaker, less durable, and more killable than them, regardless of your quirks or lack thereof. But still we fight. With our wits, our tools, and our skills, we defeat the undefeatable. One day when the beast rises from the abyss, we will kill it. Welcome to the AMF. Izuku opened his eyes, the pitter-patter of the rain a soothing contrast to the carnage he was preparing to jump into. He gave one last check to his instruments. They were all ready to go. He glanced at Achako in the driver's seat. She was staring intently out the viewing port, taking deep breaths. Izuku took a few himself. They both waited. A distant explosion went off. And another. And another. It was getting closer. Good. Closer to them was further from town. Izuku turned the turret in a long spin, examining the surrounding valley. Through the pouring rain, he could see plenty of trees that might hide them, some hills to duck behind. Maybe there was some cover by some of the cliffs. He hoped it'd be enough. If it wasn't. Tough luck. Hey Achako, he said. She turned to him, her eyebrow raised, Yam Midori. Why do you suppose this always seems to happen in the rain or at night? He said. It ruins the views. I mean, if we're going to visit tropical islands we might as well enjoy it. She cracked a smile. One, that's an exaggeration and you know it. Two, looking at the views is kinda pointless if we die by atomic fire. He smiled. That's true. I guess we should thank him for choosing to come ashore in terrible weather. Before or after you shoot him in the eye. Again, I don't only shoot him there. You're right. Sometimes you hit the groin too. I don't that's no oh my gosh you're right. Maybe that's why he seems to hate me. Achako giggled. Through the explosions, another sound became audible. One lower and more rhythmic. Like a massive drum being slowly beaten. Footsteps. Izuku's heart beat a little louder. It was almost time. Second group pull back. He's following you. Rocket squad. Distract him. Got him. He's turning slig never mind. He's still moving in the same general direction. Third group get red wait wait. It's a. Another sound echoed across the island. This one is sounding like an electrified waterfall, followed by the sound of a massive explosion. Izuku could see the hilltops lit by a blue light. A thunderous roar soon followed. Izuku felt himself tense a little. He took a deep breath. Now was not the time to lose focus. He had a job to do. Shit. He's turning. Third group. Try to divert him back onto his original path. We've been cut off by a landslide. Midoriya, you're Araka. He's heading towards you. You know what to do. Copy that. Izuku said, Achako. Their engine roared and Izuku felt a slight jolt as the tank began racing forward. Izuku moved his turret to where their quarry would soon be. Another massive explosion went off. They passed the edge of a large hill. Target lock. Firing, Izuku said. Twin beams of blue energy shot out of his tank's turrets. Huh, right in the eye? Just like you said Achako. Well, you got his attention. Shit. Izuku felt the tank bounce and tilt as Achako drove it over rough terrain. She pulled into a hard turn, throwing Izuku against his straps. He looked through his scope again. He's moving in this general direction. No sign he spotted us. Good. Hopefully it'll stay that way. The tank slowed down. It was still moving. They always had to keep moving, but no longer racing. Izuku kept his turret trained on the target, still walking where they wanted him to, away from the towns and neighborhoods, away from the civilians. Then, he's turning again. Izuku said into the radio, moving to engage. Good luck. Backup should be there soon. They were racing again. Izuku fired the tank again. Direct hit. They moved towards some thick tree banks. He's looking for us, but he's still not following. Achako said, looking back. Izuku nodded, firing again. She nodded. They sped out from their hiding place. Izuku looked at the massive silhouette of their enemy, the one they had fought so many times before. Despite, or maybe because of how outmatched he was in raw power, Izuku felt a twinge of excitement. He let loose another volley. This time he hit the groin. The silhouette began charging forward, footsteps thundering across the valley. Oh boy he's mad. 
We've got his attention now, Izuku said. Okay. Izuku saw the blue glow shining from behind the target and inside its throat. He's preparing to fire, Izuku said. Taking cover, Achako swerved to the left into a ditch behind a small hill. A blinding blue light filled the area, accompanied by a massive explosion. Luckily both had known to turn away from the light. Once it was over Izuku looked around. The area to both sides was blasted and scorched. The hill they had hidden behind was blown apart. Luckily it had shielded them when it mattered. Their opponent was uh oh. He was coming straight for them. Izuku heard the engine whine, but they didn't move. Shit, we're stuck, Achako said. She took off her glove and pressed all five fingers against the wall of their tank. Izuku felt the tank become weightless. Achako hit the ignition just as the tank was beginning to float. It pushed itself off the ground, floating forward. Achako pressed her fingers together. The tank fell back to the ground with a heavy bounce. Achako gunned the engines and drove it hem at top speed. As they neared the base of a small cliff, a massive hand raked across it. Boulders cascaded down at them. Achako swerved to avoid the falling rocks. As she did, Izuku saw the massive feet stepping toward them, each one closer than the last. Izuku heard a pulsing sound. He's getting ready to fire again. A thin ray energy hit their enemy in the chest, along with several rockets. Reinforcements have arrived. You guys find cover. Good job. Achako, on it. Achako ducked them into nearby a cave just before the tail swept away where they'd been driving. The explosions and footsteps moved away. They waited. Soon the radio came alive again. Target has entered the water. I repeat, Godzilla has entered the water. Good work everyone. The two relaxed, letting out sighs of relief. Achako chuckled. That was a close one, Izuku said with a relieved smile. Achako smiled back. Yep, but we did it. One last ride. She held out her fist. Izuku bumped it with his own. Yep, one last ride. At base, Achako checked the last of her bags before doing one last sweep of her area. She had everything. She could go. She turned to Midori. They'd been doing this together for four years. One in the mainland, three in the Pacific against Godzilla. They had fought side by side for so long. And now, for her at least, it was over. Midori, Achako said. Thanks, I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you. Midori smiled, clearly trying to hold back tears. You could have done it on your own Achako. I mean, look at what else you've done. You're the best tank driver I've ever met. You completed the AMF's exam to use your quirk in the field and got your hero license. You're incredible. But if it wasn't for your encouragement I wouldn't have tried to become a hero again. But Achako, just shut up and take the compliment for once. His head sagged. Okay. She smiled before a thought came to mind. One that had been kicking in her head for a while. Hey, Izuku. She said. He looked at her, confused. Yeah. What are your plans after this? After what? You know, AMF. D-Force. Do you really plan on fighting Godzilla forever? I don't really have any plans, he said. But there's no hurry. I can do it for a while. After all, Midori pointed to his poster of Oda Murakami, one of the AMF's founding members. He fought Godzilla into his 70s. He was taken off combat duty over 20 years before his final battle, which he died in. He shuffled his feet. Well yeah, but I don't need to think of another career just yet. I have plenty of time. He looked back at her with curious eyes. Why are you asking me this? Achako let out a deep breath and said, Do you still want to be a hero? He looked away. That was a long time ago. But do you? W we both know I can't. She pointed at his shirt and said, Bullshit. Said shirt read quirkless G-Force member, fighting villains was too dangerous. Instead I fight Godzilla. Midori looked at his favorite shirt with the expression of a child caught stealing from the cookie jar. I also seem to remember you doing pretty well when during sparring with the other guys. And that's not even talking about those analyses you make with Kenji in your spare time. I think if you wanted to, you could make it. He gave her a sad smile. Thanks Achako, I appreciate it. I really do. But even if I did want to, all the hero exams require you to have a quirk unless you're coming from an approved training program. All of those, including the night schools, require quirks. The exceptions are all high schools. High school was my only chance, and I missed it. She frowned. You bothered to look that up. You still want it, don't you? I considered briefly. But I can't and that's okay. I'm perfectly happy here, fighting Kaiju. Achako sighed. Fine. But just know that I'll do everything in my power to make it so you can take the hero exam without a quirk, and help anyone with weak or no quirks who's willing and able to become heroes. Even if I'm happy here, I'll be glad to see it, said Izuku. Good, Achako said. And if you ever get tired of this, I'll be there. Until then, stay alive. Remember, he she pointed at Murakami again. Did some of his greatest exploits in his 50s and 70s. So don't you die before then. 
Midori gave her a tearful smile. I won't. Thanks Ochako. He pulled her into a hug. She returned it. I'll miss you too. She picked up her bags. Take care of yourself. And you better stay in touch Midori. She said. I will. Take care of yourself too Ochako. And with that, the two partners parted ways. This was the end of one chapter of their lives, and the beginning of another. There'd been seven disappeared hikers in the last two weeks. Six destroyed cars found along the highway, their drivers nowhere to be found. Finally, reports of a massive Sasquatch-like villain attacking several towns resulting in massive collateral damage and nearly two dozen missing persons. Ruko and the other pussycats triangulated the villain's location to a remote lake in the mountains. They found its cave via helicopter before calling Mount Lady and lurkers to mount an attack on the villain's lair. They were ready to bring this villain to justice, only to be unceremoniously thrown off the case by the AMF again. If you were a hero who worked in the mountains on any sort of regular basis you'd run into these guys at least once. A government agency tasked with handling quirked animals which this villain apparently was that styled itself like a military organization and refused to cooperate with heroes. Ever. Now since heroes were just about everywhere these days and wouldn't just ignore a situation in progress, the AMF let them to stop the smaller ones without complaint. But when heroes tried to deal with the big ones further in the wilderness, ones that required organization and planning, those self-important jackasses were all too happy to bring their jurisdiction bullshit down on them. Which brought the heroes to where they were now, standing on the wrong side of the barricades being heckled by a couple of guards. We told you, this is AMF business. Go back to saving kittens from trees or whatever you heroes do, said the shorter guard. Yeah, this is our job, the other said. Why don't you find a camera you can mug to for a few extra bucks? To Ruko's left, Tiger and Tomoko were helping Kamui Wood stop Mount Lady from strangling the two. She'd definitely never dealt with the AMF before. Look, if you want be in charge then fine, said Shino. But let us help. We all have quirks that would be very useful for this job. Let us speak with your commanders and... Let me say it one more time, said the taller guard. We neither need nor want your useful quirks. Go away and be a publicity who. That's enough. A shorter man, with freckles and green eyes, walked up behind the two guards with a stern expression. The two guards looked at him for a moment then stood at attention. Lieutenant, said the taller one. What's going on here? The lieutenant said. These heroes, one said his voice oozing with disgust, were trying to get access to our operation. I was telling them where they can shove it. The lieutenant glared at him. Heroes do an important job and help countless people every year. You should treat them with respect even when denying them entry. Huh? An AMF guy who actually respected heroes. That was new. The man turned to the heroes. Sorry about that, he said to them with a polite smile. A lot of the people here don't really appreciate heroes, but I do. Actually, I have a question for you all. The gathered heroes glanced at each other. Fire away, said Shino. He pulled out a notebook. Can I have your autographs? What? They stared for a long moment. The guards stared too. Dude, have you no shame? One of them said. Not in my excellent taste, no, the lieutenant said. Sure, that's a great idea, said Mount Lady. She quickly took the book, signed it, then passed it to the other heroes who signed it too. Always good to meet a fan out here. I'm Mount Lady. And you are, she said flashing him her pearly whites. Midoriya ma'am. Midoriya, nice to meet you, she said. She put on an exaggerated desperate expression with a pair of puppy dog eyes for good measure. You see, me and the others here want to help you guys case but these two won't let us. I don't suppose you could. Nope, Midoriya said, snatching his book back. But we can help, said Shino. We'll be fine, he said, his tone polite but firm. You guys' job is to fight villains. Monsters are our job. We have it well handled, so don't worry. He turned and walked back toward the heavy vehicles parked nearby which included tanks and giant satellite dishes. On the back of his uniform was a design featuring a dinosaur breathing blue fire with the caption Kingslayers. Huh? said the taller guard. G-Force. The other one said, I knew those guys were crazy but I didn't think they were shameless too. Ruko glanced at her friends. So much for that guy helping them. Maybe there was another way they could intervene. Izuku walked to the waiting Mazer tanks, grinning as he read the six new autographs. What's got you so happy? Did Godzilla show up? Izuku glanced over at his friend and AMF analyst Kenji Sigusa, who was walking toward him. No, I got those heroes autographs though, Izuku said showing off his notebook. Bet it's easy when no one else wants them, said Kenji. Yep, said Izuku. Anything new with the Gargantua? Nope, so far everything's normal. Typical raid pattern, typical home, typical reaction to us. Still ignoring us? Yeah, it's starting to get agitated, but not enough to worry about. Izuku opened his mouth. Though I didn't sense any other ones, said Kenji. Izuku gave him a look. 
Kenji tapped his head with a little smirk. He turned back to the lake. If a big enough piece did break off it either hasn't spawned or already left. Let's hope the first, said Izuku. Yeah, said Kenji. They pass the Type 90 Mazer tanks with their massive satellite dish-like turrets. They may pack one heck of a punch, but Izuku vastly preferred his own tank. Speaking of, Izuku and Kenji approached his beautiful squad of MBAW 93 seconds. The perfect mix of power and speed. Zenikairo was standing next to his and Izuku's tank, eating candy. He'd been Izuku's driver in the three years since Achako left. He spotted them and smiled. Izuku, I was beginning to worry you'd miss the fight. Izuku grinned at him. Not a chance. Just taking a slight detour. Hey Sekizawa, Kenji said with a wave. Zenikairo nodded. Sup Sigusa. Wanna know what Izuku was really doing? Said Kenji. There were a group of heroes near the gate you see. Zenikairo grinned. He did not. He did. Zenikairu turned to Izuku. You are such a fanboy. I'm not, said Izuku. I just appreciate heroes that's all. Riyad said Kenji. Hey, how would either of you even know? Izuku said pointing accusingly. No one else here even likes heroes so you have no frame of reference. Achako, they said. Izuku groaned. His best friend had betrayed him. Oh the humiliation. Oig force. Enjoying the wimp tanks, said a passing Mazer pilot. Why don't you try a real Mazer? He pointed at the type 90 seconds. Only when I want to be a sitting duck. Zenikairo called back. He turned to Kenji. Hey Sigusa, catch? He tossed a round candy ball to Kenji. Gee, then Kenji tried to bite it, but the stubborn candy refused to break. After several unsuccessful attempts, he gave Zenikairo a deadpan stare. Really? Again? Not my fault you can't handle an itty bitty jawbreaker, Zenikairo said as he bit one in half with a smug grin. Screw you man. Zenikairu grinned wider. Izuku looked away to hide his own smile. There they went again. I gotta go to the command tent to watch, said Kenji. Tomorrow I'm heading back to the Pacific. We're going back soon too, said Izuku. Our rotation mainland ends in a few days. Then it's back to the Pacific to hunt enemy number one. Great, said Zenikairo. More bugs, more heat, more misery. I should have become a journalist. Didn't you say that doesn't pay? Said Kenji. True, said Zeni climbing into the Mazer tank. See you in the Pacific Sigusa. Don't worry, I'll keep Midoriya alive so he can do all your work for you when he gets back. Up yours Sekizawa. See you when you get back. The bugs will be waiting. Zenikairu flipped Kenji off with a big grin, then climbed inside. Izuku gave Kenji a thumbs up. See you when we get back. Good monster hunting, said Kenji returning it. Izuku climbed into the tank and got into his station. He and his squad were to be on the other side of the lake in case the Gargantua managed to make it across. This also happened to put the G-Force squad far away from everyone else, but surely that was a coincidence. Their tanks rolled toward their positions. Izuku got out an iodine tablet before remembering this was a Gargantua. Izuku put the tablet back in the bottle and tucked it away. He held out a fist for Zenny. Ready? Zenny bumped it. Ready? Let's kill another. Yeah. Izuku's thoughts turned to All Might, and the words he'd said that fateful day all those years ago. Just watch me. I have no quirk. Just a team fighting with our tech, strategy, and skills. We're going to fight an enemy you'd say can't be beaten without power. And we're going to kill it. The AMF took their positions around the lake, with the majority of the attack force on one side, and Izuku's squad on the other. They trained their guns and waited. Izuku, Yashiro, and Akiba's tanks were on three separate hills, giving them a solid vantage point on everything while being separated enough that they couldn't be taken out with a single attack. The only potential problem was a group of tall boulders that the Gargantua could hide behind if it reached them. Fortunately, their mazers were more than strong enough to cut through them. Still, maybe they should. Target inbound. Izuku swiveled his turret as a helicopter came into view, followed soon after by a turquoise Gargantua. It was a typical specimen, standing at a respectable 30 meters while covered in long ratty fur. Nothing special, they'd killed plenty like it before. The Gargantua followed the helicopter like a fly to the bug zapper, ineffectively batting at the chopper as it walked slowly, but surely toward the AMF's kill zone. Izuku fijated with his fingers. Closer, closer, commence attack. Came the voice over the speaker. The Gargantua jerked its leg back with a pained yelp as it stepped on the Mazer fence. A series of thin plasma beams at the Gargantua's ankle level. Ineffective for trapping it. Perfect for getting it to stop at the right spot. Nearby, the Type 90 Mazers had already locked target. Lightning bolts erupted from the satellite dish turrets, raking the Gargantua's hide. The Gargantua howled and rushed backward to escape, but the Mazers were relentless. The Gargantua fell to its knees. Ducking down, it tried to crawl behind the trees but the Mazer bolts cut through them like dry twigs as they hit the Gargantua. 
This monster had seen humanity as mere prey, powerless to defend themselves. Thought it was learning why humanity was the dominant species even before quirks appeared. What they lacked in brute force, they made up for with their brains. Izuku slowly swiveled his turret to follow the fleeing Gargantua. If it somehow made it over the lake he wanted to be ready. The Gargantua kept crawling, refusing to give up its futile attempt to escape the AMF's attack. It made it to the lake and tried to leap in. Too bad the lake had been electrified. In the water, the Gargantua writhed in pain in the water as the electricity did its work, sending waves crashing against the nearby shores. From a nearby cliff the pussycats and lurkers had gathered to watch the battle. Ruko curled her lip in disgust at the animal's pain. If they were going to kill it couldn't they at least do it quickly? The creature was big, she'd give them that. But if they wanted to act like a military, then wouldn't a barrage of missiles do that with much more humanity than this? Ruko looked away and began forming a stone beast just in case she needed to intervene. She may not like what they were doing but she was still a hero and refused to let them die for it. Poor bastard, Zeni said. Izuku nodded. Even an experienced monster hunter like him couldn't help but pity the creature when it was like this, and helpless and defeated. Unfortunately, killing a kaiju was rarely quick. It was one of the problems that came when dealing with animals that could shrug off missile fire. Izuku resisted the urge to look away. He had to be ready if it. The Gargantua threw itself toward Izuku's side of the shore, frantically trying to push itself through the water. Get ready, said Izuku. Copy, said Yashiro. Copy, said Akiba. By some miracle, the Gargantua managed to clamber ashore but Izuku's team was ready. They opened fire, sending beams of blue plasma into the Gargantua's chest. The Gargantua barely avoided falling back into the water as it crawled behind the boulders for cover. Yashiro, circle around and flank it, said Izuku. Akiba, you and I will fire through the rocks and try to keep him pinned down. Roger, Roger. As Yashiro's tank began circling, Izuku and Akiba fired at the boulders, their mazers burrowing through and out the other side. Akiba fired on the edge of the rock so the creature couldn't escape. Izuku alternated between doing that and firing where he believed the Gargantua was. Based on the sounds, he was right several times. As the rocks crumbled, Izuku caught glimpses of the Gargantua moving behind them. One of its arms shot out, sending something into the air. Izuku looked and saw a giant stone flying down toward Akiba. Akiba, the boulder crashed and sideswiped Akiba's tank, knocking it on its side. Akiba, are you all right? Said Izuku. We're fine. Just shaken, said Akiba. It'll take more than that to kill us. Izuku was about to reply but before he could, the Gargantua started running straight toward the down tank. Izuku fired at its legs. The creature stumbled, but didn't stop. Shit, said Zeni. Izuku was thrown against his seatbelt as Zeni floored it, sending their tank racing forward. He swerved toward the down tank and sped down the hill to rescue it. As Zeni drove, Izuku continued firing on the Gargantua. They were closer, but the Gargantua was faster. It was going to be a close race. Good thinking Zeni, Izuku said while firing. No, not great thinking. Thinking like you is not good thinking, Zeni said. Yet here he was, still doing it. Izuku fired into the Gargantua's back, legs, and occasionally, its head. Two more blasts hit its back as Yashiro's tank joined him. The Gargantua slowed but did not stop. As Izuku neared the fallen tank so did the Gargantua. Take us close so I can draw its attention away from the Akiba, said Izuku. Damn it, why am I doing this instead of being a reporter like mom wanted? Zenikairu said while doing what Izuku said. They moved until they were a little out of the creature's reach and, with a precision refined from many battles, Izuku shot the Gargantua in the jaw. The Gargantua roared with fury and whipped and started to lunge at them. Its arm reached out. Izuku aimed for the eye. He had one shot at this. A stone bird dove for the Gargantua's face, distracting it. Pixie Bob. The Gargantua destroyed the bird with a single swing. But Izuku used the distraction to blast it in the face. While he knew he should appreciate the help, a part of him burned at the idea of heroes intruding on their battle. Izuku ignored it as he fired at the Gargantua's legs. It tried to stagger away, but walked right in front of Akiba's turret. Akiba opened fire, sending the Gargantua to the ground while Izuku and Yashiro bombarded it. The creature's strength seemed to be spent. Its movements slowly ceased. They kept firing anyway. They had to be sure. The other mazers came and joined them. Minutes later, they were called off and the body was examined. It was confirmed. The Gargantua was dead. Any flesh that came off in the fighting would have been cauterized so it couldn't regenerate. It was over. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. Izuku, Zeni said holding out a hand. Izuku smiled and shook it. Good job everyone, Izuku said into his calm. 
Akiba, how are you? Well, my pride took a decent it, he said. So you're fine, said Izuku. Yeah, Kisarog is fine too. Good, Izuku said. Let's get you guys out of there. Then we can go and get drinks. Fine, as long as I'm not buying. Especially Sekizawa's. Awa, is someone still sore from last time? Said Zenny. You bought a 4,000 yen drink. You said you'd buy me any drink. Not my fault I took you at your word. Screw you. Izuku chuckled. These guys were impossible. To another successful mission. Said Zenny hoisting his glass high. They toasted. Another one bites the dust. Said Akiba. After killing the Gargantua, the AMF began cleanup protocol. The Mazers returned to base, but not before Izuku gave an obligatory thank you to Pixie Bob and the other heroes. They hadn't been too receptive, between being disgusted by the Gargantua's death and unaware of its necessity. It was hard enough to contain a hostile animal that could smash buildings like cardboard and shrug off tank fire like bug bites, but when said animal had regenerative abilities so strong it could grow an entire new specimen from a decent-sized piece of flesh, it had to be killed, down to the last cell and mazers were the most reliable way to do it. Granted, explaining that would be easier if other members of the AMF didn't insist on throwing insults at the heroes at every opportunity. But that was then. Now was time to enjoy their victory with cold drinks and lame jokes. Up yours Dr. Frankenstein, said Hayama, Yashiro's driver, as he took a swig. Here's to roasting another one, said Akiba, raising his glass, and making fools of anyone who ever said we'd never accomplish anything said Izuku, raising his. Here, here, said Zenny. They toasted and drank. It was nice being on the mainland, said Izuku. Yeah, we get a break from all those monsters in the Pacific, said Zenny. You talking about the kaiju or the bugs, said Akiba with a wry grin. Or the bug kaiju, said Hayama. Both. True, said Izuku, but it'll be nice to be back. Akiba rolled his eyes. You're just glad because it's the start of the active season soon. Izuku yelped. How could he say such slander? I'm not, he said. Izuku, said Zenny, you're borderline addicted to fighting monsters, especially the big guy. I'm not addicted. I just take my job very seriously, said Izuku to the slanderous trader. They all gave him a deadpan stare. Not buying it, said Akiba. Nope, said Zenny. The only thing you're more addicted to is reading that old biography, said Hayama. Izuku crossed his arms. I hate you guys. No you don't, said Zenikairu. Anyone have a different topic they'd like to share? Izuku said. They decommissioned the third fleet, said Yashiro, staring into an empty glass. What? said Akiba. Why? said Hayama. Money. They cut our budget again and couldn't afford it. But we only have two left, said Hayama. We can't possibly be expected to patrol all of Japan's waters like this. We barely have enough to do our job as is. Are they trying to get people killed? The others nodded. At this rate, the only thing that would get them to pay attention to us would be a kaiju making it to a populated area, said Akiba. Which they'd probably use it as an excuse shut us down altogether, said Hayama. Depending on the kaiju, said Zenny. Yeah, they'd find it real hard to ignore us if Godzilla waltzed into a decent-sized city, said Akiba. We shouldn't talk like that, said Izuku, swirling his drink. A kaiju attacking a populated area would be a disaster. We'll find a way to make do. We always do. Such a disaster that may soon be unavoidable, said Yashiro. We can barely hold the line as is, and with each cut it gets harder. We're caught in an vicious loop, said Zenny. They looked at him. We've kept the big ones out of the cities for over 50 years, Zenny continued. People have more or less forgotten about them, out of sight, out of mind and all. So they cut our budget. Then we focus what we have on stopping the big ones first, which lets smaller ones to break through. Then they think we're not doing our jobs and cut again. Then we focus what we have on the big ones first allowing more to get through and on it goes until Godzilla gets through. Then, disaster. Let's just hope they can stop that before it gets that far, said Kisaragi as the others nodded. Let's talk about something else, Zenny said. You guys know why they called me the bulldog in high school. Akiba rolled his eyes. Hayama groaned. Ishiro and Kisaragi exchanged glances. Only Izuku showed any interest. Every time Zenny tried telling this story he got cut off. Izuku kind of wanted to know the answer. Zenny continued, It was because when I worked for, Hey are you guys new? A new voice said. They all looked up. A young man in an AMF uniform was giving them a cocky grin. I know most of the guys around here and I've never seen you. Did you guys just join up? Because I've got some stories you'd better listen to if you want to. We're Task Force 54 rookie, said Akiba. From the Pacific. The man stared blankly. Nicknamed G-Force. Still a blank stare. We fight Godzilla. Oh right, the man said. Never mind. He turned and hurried toward a different group of AMF personnel to inflict his stories on them. 
how much you wanna bet he's going to brag about being in a battle against the Kamikaris or something, said Zenny with a smirk. And he didn't even fight, he was there as backup, said Akiba. But he'll make himself sound like the best backup you didn't need. Zenny finished. The two laughed while the others let out a light chuckle. They then took a swig of beer. Izuku shook his head, then took a swig himself. He loved these guys. In the depths of the Pacific, the creatures of the deep move about, tending to their day-to-day -day habits of survival. It is a harsh environment, but they have adapted to it, learning many important things, such as where to find food, and when to flee danger. As one, they scattered, swimming in every direction. Near the epicenter of their flight from sat an oddly shaped bunch of coral. Beneath said coral was an equally odd lump of rock. On that lump of rock, a massive eye opened. We're coming to you live from the Bunta shopping district, where a massive villain attack has caused severe damage to multiple buildings. Dozens of injuries have been reported. Authorities and heroes are on site performing rescue operations as we speak. Reports indicate, Ryaiko clung to her teddy bear, Mr. Muffins, tears streaming down her face. She couldn't see, she had no idea where she was, and her leg hurt. She'd tried to move around, but there were giant rocks on all sides, trapping her. Occasionally she heard people yelling and moving outside and hoped they'd find her, but none did. The rocks shifted. Ryaiko squeezed Mr. Muffins even tighter. She wanted her mommy. Help. She screamed. Help. She tried again. She heard voices and movement outside. The rocks in front of her flashed pink and lifted away. Sunlight streamed in, forcing Ryaiko to cover her eyes. Hey there, are you okay? Ryaiko opened her eyes to see a lady with brown hair wearing a pink and black suit smiling at her. Ryaiko gasped. Uravity, that's me. Uravity said as she knelt down next to Ryaiko. Your leg looks scraped. Does it hurt? Ryaiko nodded. A little. What about the rest of you? Does anything else hurt? Ryaiko shook her head. No. Good, Uravity said with a relieved smile. Let's get you out of here. Uravity scooped up Ryaiko and carried her away. As they made their way outside, Ryaiko looked around. Heroes and firemen were scrambling around like a bunch of ants. A lot of the buildings had pieces missing while the street was covered in overturned cars and giant stones. Uravity carried Ryaiko to an ambulance where a bunch of other people were being helped. As they got closer, Ryaiko saw two familiar figures. Mommy, Daddy, Ryaiko, Sweetie. Mommy and Daddy ran over to Uravity while two ambulance people followed. The two hugged Ryaiko, crying. We were so worried. We couldn't find you. Ryaiko clung to Daddy's neck. I was so scared. But then Uravity saved me. Thank you so much. We can never repay you for this. They said to Uravity. Uravity said, I'm just glad I could help. Then she turned and started talking to one of the ambulance people while the other picked up Ryaiko and carried her toward the ambulance. Just before getting in, Ryaiko looked back at Uravity, who waved. By Ryaiko. Ryaiko waved back. By Uravity. Achako smiled as the girl got in the ambulance with her tearful parents. Moments like this reminded her why she loved being a hero. She turned back to the destroyed area. And moments like this remind me why I need to be one. Achako ran around the destroyed area, helping wherever she was needed. Rubble to be cleared. She was on it. A wall about to fall. Busy. Civilians to help and comfort. No problem. Achako had done this enough times over the last three years that she barely even needed to think about what to do. Didn't mean it wasn't hard work though. Achako wiped some sweat from her brow after moving some heavy equipment. She could have used her quirk, but she'd used it a lot today and wanted to save some energy. Gravity. Achako turned at the familiar voice of her boss Nejire Hado, who was hovering over her. We got a call about a villain attack three blocks west. I'm going over there now. We've cleared most of the rubble here so I want you to come with me. Achako took a quick look around. Sure enough most of the heavy lifting was already done. Achako nodded at Nejire. Let's go. Nejire grinned and rocketed off with her quirk. Achako pressed her fingers to her palms, making herself weightless before kicking off. She pointed her wrist gauntlets at some nearby buildings and fired two grappling lines. The grapplers latched onto two different buildings. The lines began reeling in, yanking Achako forward. When she got close enough she released the buildings, reeled in the lines, and fired again. Doing this she flew between the buildings, easily keeping pace with Nejire. One of the other psychics at the agency once compared how Achako traveled to how the main characters of an old manga would fight giant monsters. She'd had no idea why that made Achako laugh. They arrived in less than two minutes. From their vantage point they could see the villains clearly. There were two of them. One was 12 feet tall and seemed to have the power to telekinetically control three metal balls, which he was using to smash up the nearby area. 
The other had a wolf-like quirk and was using his teeth and claws to lash out at everything he could sink them into. Achako nodded at Nejire then aimed at the wolf one while Nejire went for the other. Achako pressed the pads on her fingertips together, returning her gravity. She plummeted in a dive toward the wolf villain, then flipped over and stretched out her leg before cancelling her gravity again her boot slammed into the villain's jaw before stopping a foot above the ground. Achako returned her gravity and surveyed her handiwork. The villain slumped to the ground, seemingly unconscious. Achako had slowed down enough to avoid killing him, but had still been fast enough that he should be out for. The villain got up. Never mind. The villain lashed out with his claws. Achako threw herself backwards, raising an arm to let the claws scrape her uracarist. The villain's hand embedded itself in a nearby car. Achako inspected her uracarist. Barely scratched the paint. Good. That meant they should be able to defend her. The villain wrenched his hand out of the car, rocking the vehicle. The villain shook his wrist. Achako narrowed her eyes. He'd overextended that swing by a mile. Also, given that he'd rocked the entire car she was guessing he'd yanked a lot harder than he needed to. His technique was sloppy. She could use that. The villain turned to her and growled. Achako began slowly circling him, maintaining eye contact. The villain crept towards her step by step. Achako flared her nostrils. The villain bared his teeth. She raised her fists closer to her face. The villain snarled then threw himself at her. Achako dove away and somersaulted along the ground to escape. The villain landed awkwardly, falling to the ground. Achako moved to attack, but stopped when the villain got up and turned around. They faced off again. Achako stepped forward as if ready to attack. The villain took the bait and swung his hand at her. Achako used her wrist gauntlet to parry, grabbed his arm, and kneed him in the gut before leaping back. The villain staggered backward, clutching his belly. He then roared before charging at her. Using precise movements, she parried his attacks one by one until he left himself open to a punch in the face. The villain shook his head then resumed his assault with that stubborn one-track mind of his. He flailed at Achako, who danced around his claws until she could deliver an uppercut to the jaw. She made a feint toward his face then threw a right hook into his gut. The villain stumbled back. Achako charged, kicked out his knee, then grabbed him with all five fingers to cancel his gravity. Achako swung the wolf villain over her head and threw him into a nearby car. Achako grabbed him and threw him again. He collided headfirst with a fire hydrant. Achako returned his gravity and got out the capture tape. Now all she had to do was. The villain threw himself to his feet and flung himself at Achako did he have any other strategy. Achako sidestepped, allowing him to crash into the ground. Achako tried to cancel his gravity, but the villain swung his arm out and hit her with a back and that sent her rolling over a nearby car. Achako got up just in time to see his claws flying toward her face. The villain scraped his claws against the asphalt and swiped upward, sending a rain of gravel at Achako's eyes. She raised her arms just in time to avoid being blinded, but when she lowered them the villain was lashing out to disembowel her. Achako barely managed to avoid his attack, letting him crash into one of the nearby cars. Before she could cancel his gravity again, the villain swung out his arm and backhanding her. Achako was sent rolling over a nearby car. She got up just in time to see his claws flying toward her face. Achako got her hands up just in time to avoid being mauled. The villain tackled her to the ground and grabbed her wrists, keeping her from cancelling his gravity. He opened his fanged mouth an inch towards her throat, ready to deal the finishing blow. Achako kneed him between the legs. The wolf villain reeled back in pain, allowing Achako to cancel his gravity and shove him into the air. The villain flailed as he floated upwards, helpless to control his movement. Achako got up, rolled her shoulders, then watched him float. After he was 20 feet or so she dropped him down to earth, and the villain was still trying to get up. I'd respect if I wasn't certain it was less determination and more because he's too dumb to notice he's lost. Achako picked up a nearby car and swung it at the villain like a baseball bat. The villain skipped across the ground before hitting a wall. Then Achako pinned him with the car. Hard. After disabling her opponent, Achako turned to see how Nejire was doing. The villain she'd been fighting now occupied a small crater in the sidewalk while Nejire asked questions whether they were trying to overthrow society or just rob banks. Or overthrow society by robbing banks. Soon a crowd of civilians ran over to the heroes surrounding Nejire for autographs. A smaller group came to Achako too, mostly people who'd already gotten Nejire's autograph or had decided to avoid the larger crowd by going to Achako first. Though there were some genuine Uravity fans, which she appreciated. After entertaining the crowd and giving their statements to the police, Achako and Nejire both took off again, this time heading back to the agency, and not a minute too soon. 
She was bushed. Achako and Nejire passed over rooftops as they made their way to Nejire's agency. Achako savored the feeling of air passing though her hair as she grappled from building to building. It felt so free. She was glad she'd gotten that hero license. They landed in front of the rooftop door. Nejire began fumbling through her belt to get her keys. Don't worry, I got this, said Achako, pulling her own key out and unlocking it. Thanks, Uravity. Hey, do you think we should put a mat up here? We could even put a fake key under it while hiding the real key somewhere else. No one will predict that. Maybe, Achako said. As they got inside that grin faded. They may have vanquished the villains, but now they faced a greater threat. Paperwork. Achako shook her head as she filled out yet another redundant and unnecessarily bloated form. Doing paperwork be a fact of life, and knowing how to do it well had taken her far. But did she hate the stuff with an intensity that matched Godzilla's nuclear breath? The stuff had been annoying enough with the AMF and it had only gotten worse since she became a hero. On the other hand, it could be worse. Poor Nejire was saddled with twice as much since, as the head of the agency, she needed to fill out forms regarding her sidekicks too after the incident in Bunta. When Achako went solo she was so limiting the number of sidekicks in her agency, or getting a secretary she'd pay a handsomely to papers for her. After over an hour of intense tedium, Achako was finally free for the day. She changed out of her hero costume, used the agency showers using her own water cost money, then made her way out. She nodded goodbye to her co-workers, grinned at overhearing some psychics betting on Achako's career before being a hero again, and went to say goodbye to Nejire. Nejire, said Achako. Nejire looked up, looking dead inside. What? I'm leaving for the day. Good night. Good hey wait a minute. There's something I have to ask you, Nejire said, her eyes becoming alert again. Achako blinked. What is it? You know Tsu, the one with the frog quirk who went by the name Froppy, left a while ago to form her own agency. Remember her? Achako nodded. Yeah I remembered Tsu. How's she doing? She's doing great. Anyway, she called me earlier about a team up to deal with some smugglers in the Sea of Japan. Apparently, these guys have some heavy hitters so she and Selkie were asking for extra help. Gang orcas on board, but they were wondering if I wanted to come and bring a sidekick with me. And you want me to join you? Achako said. Yep. Here are the dates we have planned. She pointed to some boxes on her calendar she'd marked off. Achako snapped a photo of them with her phone. Looks good. But I might have something important planned, said Achako. Mind if I check first? Of course, said Nejire. You can tell me tomorrow. Now go home and get your beauty rest. Thanks Nejire, Achako said. Anytime. Achako left the agency and boarded a train home. After arriving at the house and walking inside, Achako said, Hey guys, I'm back. Mina gave an exhausted thumbs up from the couch. Good to see you Achako. Kendo and Satsuna were at the table eating dinner. Hey Achako, long day for you too, said Kendo. Yeah, said Achako. I was helping with that disaster in Bunta for several hours. You guys, busy patrol, said Mina as she got to her feet. The villains just wouldn't stop showing up. TV appearance for some dumb commercial, said Satsuna. Paperwork, said Kendo. Ouch, looks like we've all had a long day, Achako said. She walked to the fridge thinking about what to eat. Actually, she should probably go grocery shopping soon. Her stash was running low. By the way, Achako, said Mina. I got some great news. Achako perked up. Hmm, what is it? That charity you were interested in. They said they'd love to have you for one of their upcoming events. Here's the dates. Check em out. Achako hurried over and looked. Soonest one was after the mission with Nejire. Good. Thanks Mina, Achako said. It means a lot to me. You're welcome, said Mina. Anything for a friend. She gave Achako a sunny thumbs up. By the way, I'm meeting some of my old classmates tonight for some fun, said Mina. Any of you wanna come? No thanks, I'm bushed, said Satsuna. I'll pass, said Kendo. I'm good. Have fun, said Achako as she got out ingredients for dinner. You do know you can order food right, said Satsuna. Cooking my own is cheaper, said Achako. Probably healthier too. Why are you such a cheapskate sometimes, said Satsuna. You do realize you have almost as much, if not more money than the rest of us, which I did not get by being wasteful. Insanely reckless maybe, but not wasteful. Besides, if I spent more every time I started making extra money, I'd be left with the same amount I'd started with. Lifestyle creep wasn't screwing her over, thank you very much. Satsuna waved her off. Whatever. Speaking of money, rent's due in a week, said Kendo. You got your shares. Achako nodded. I'll send it right over. Mina groaned. I'll send mine too. Me three, said Satsuna. As Achako was cooking, her phone dinged. Midori, heading back to Pacific. Saw your work in Boont. Good work with the rescue and villain. 
Achako began typing back. Me, thanks Midori. Heard about your fight with the Gargantua. Nice work. Bummer we didn't get to meet each other while you were at the mainland. Next time maybe. Midori, maybe we can coordinate when we have time off. It would be great to see you again. You heard about that fight. Achako rolled her eyes. Me, there are still forums following Kaiju. They may be rare but they still exist. You should know. You introduced me to them. And yeah we should try that. It would be great. Midori, you still go to those forums. Me, duh. Have to follow you guys somehow and you're not exactly in the news these days. Midori, don't remind me. The guys here do it plenty enough. Me, they do. A lot of AMF members hated heroes, seeing them as glory hogs taking attention and funding from fighting the monsters. Even the ones who didn't hate heroes weren't exactly fans, with Midori as a rare exception. Midori, yeah. Helps that you're considered one of us. Me, thanks for telling me. I gotta eat dinner. Have a good flight back and enjoy Murakami's book. Midori, how would you know if I'm reading it? What if I'm not? Me, are you? Midori, never mind, enjoy your food. Achako giggled. Poor fanboy, so predictable. She typed back. Me, will do. As she finished her dinner there was a knock at the door. Mina thrust it open and said. Guys, hey Ashido, ready to have a night on the town. Said an out of costume chargeable. You don't need to yell Denki. She's literally three feet ahead of you, said earphone Jack. Hey Ashido, good to see you again, said Red Riot. Hey Kirishima, said Mina. Let's go and party. Oh and you brought back Hugo too. How'd you do it? Blackmail, shut up. Achako watched the friend group chat in the doorway, her eyes lingering on the last one. Dynamite, one of the top heroes in Japan, notorious for having a hot temper and a bit of an ego. According to Mina, he was mostly bark with his friends. And yet, Achako had never pressed Midori for details of his personal life, especially his time in school. But some things had slipped through. Could Dynamite be? She shook her head. That wasn't important. Midori made it quite clear that he wanted to put his past behind him. Dragging up his old enemies wouldn't help with that. Achako finished her food, watched TV, trained a little, then headed to bed. She'd had a long day, and it was nice to get some rest. No paperwork, no roommate problems, no villains. Deka City, Detnarat, possibly the greatest front organization ever built. A powerful and successful lifestyle support company with high-paying executives, innovative technology, and plenty of donations to various non-profits. All of which were used to further the glorious cause of the Meta Liberation Army. Rikia Yatsubashi, Redistro, the one true heir to the great visionary that was his ancestor, looked out at the city he'd built. A city situated in the mountains, limited entry and exit points, with all land owned by Detnarat or shell companies connected to them. A company town firmly controlled by the Meta Liberation Army, built on the ruins of their prior defeat. The perfect place to prepare for his revenge on all who dared defy the grand vision of the mighty Destro, and Yatsubashi took a deep breath. Calm down, you have a meeting soon. It won't do to be tense and unfriendly in a meeting now would it? As if on cue his intercom beeped. Mr. Yatsubashi, your 8 o'clock is here. That's great Akihiro, he said. Send them right in. Two men entered. One was an older gentleman. He had an inexpensive suit worn with the utmost dignity. It was ironed, pressed and neatly worn to look as presentable as possible. A man eager to please, or who holds himself in high esteem. Judging by the way the man carried himself, with a confident gait and an expression of formality mixed with arrogance, it was the latter. The other was a younger man with a very different demeanor. Black hair left uncombed, off-center tie, a ruffled jacket, and multiple wrinkles on the pants. He wore the suit as a formality but obviously didn't care for appearances. An impudent upstart. They'd sought out the MLA, asking for material resources to build something. Something they said would cause great destruction. The two sent a list of equipment they wanted and fragments of their blueprints. While the tech wasn't hard to get per se, not for the MLA, it wasn't the sort of thing a garden variety villain would be looking for. Yatsubashi was curious. Welcome gentlemen, he said with a genial smile. How was the drive-in? The younger man looked to the older one, who said, Quite well Mr. Yatsubashi. It is an honor to meet you. So the old one was the spokesperson for the two. Logical. Please, no need to be so formal, said Yatsubashi. Have a seat. Would you care for a drink? No thank you, said the old man as he sat down. The younger one stayed standing behind him. The older man threw him an annoyed look before making eye contact with Yatsubashi. I must say your list of items you wanted was quite interesting, said Yatsubashi. So, what's your proposition? It's a device that we believe can call something. Something that would further your cause, said the younger man. How so, said Yatsubashi. Have you perchance heard of the AMF or Anti-Megalosaurus Force, said the younger man. Yatsubashi's fists clenched. Oh yes he'd heard of them. 
a government agency tasked with handling animals with meta-abilities. Instead of using those with strong meta-abilities of their own, they used outdated weapons handled by the weak and pre-evolved who dared think they could stand up to gods. We have a way for you to get rid of them, by giving their jurisdiction to the heroes, said the younger man. He gave Yatsubashi an oily smirk. All you'd need do is give us the equipment we need, maybe some disposable fugs, and perform two little acts, insignificant for a man like you. Yatsubashi's lips curled upwards. As faulty as the hero system was, at least it used meta abilities and recognized their importance. I'm listening. Izuku got off the plane into the nice familiar heat. It was good to be back. As he walked across the tarmac, Izuku glanced over at the vehicle lot. The sun gleamed off the green of tanks and chrome of maser turrets parked in the lot. Jeeps, regular tanks, MBAW 93 seconds like Izuku's, and the heavy hitters, the MBT 92 seconds. Slower than his tank, it was used for either the more vulnerable kaiju or the ones that lacked ranged attacks. Slow or not, it packed one heck of a punch. Several of the vehicles had designs painted on them, mostly images of various kaiju and jokes. Izuku thought back to when he and Ochako graffitied their tank a few months after arriving here. It was some of the best fun Izuku had ever had at that point. When Zeni became Izuku's driver, he added a few touches of his own, but left Izuku and Ochako's work untouched. His best idea was painting former property of Uravity on the left side. Speaking of whom, Zeni looked about as happy to be back as Endeavor would with his toy sales. Why does it have to be so hot? And why do the bugs go after me? He said slapping his neck. I even put on bug spray. It's their way of saying they love you, said Akiba. Even when you smell terrible, they just can't resist welcoming you back. Shut up Akiba. Why are you even complaining? Said Kisaragi. You literally volunteer to be here. That's another thing I can complain about. Said Zeni with a big grin. My poor judgment. Kisaragi shook her head at the hopeless case that was Zenikairo Sekizawa. Izuku and his squad returned to their barracks to put their bags by the beds. Captain Sakaki passed them in the halls. Izuku nodded at him, which Sakaki returned with a terse one of his own before continuing on his way. An actual nod. What's got him so happy? Said Akiba when he was out of earshot. Haruo Sakaki was one of the other members of the AMF with no quirk. He was infamous for his hot temper and abrasive attitude. Despite that, he was still a good tactician and skilled commander, near fanatical hatred of Godzilla aside. After settling in, Izuku decided to visit the analysts. He wondered what kind of quirked animals or kaiju they were looking at now. He went inside the lab to find the analysts in the usual pattern of either actually working or trying to look like they were. Hey, look who's back, one said as he walked through the door. Kenji looked up from his computer. Hey Midoriya, welcome back. To hell, another added. Izuku ignored him. Hi Kenji, said Izuku. How have you guys been? Fine, said Kenji with an easy smile. Just seeing what nightmares nature has cooked up for us this time. You wanna see? Izuku nodded. Yeah, anything interesting? Yeah, there's a giant bee you should take a look at, said Kenji waving Izuku over. Izuku grabbed a seat and rolled it next to Kenji's. It's around a meter in length and lives in this area in the mountains, Kenji said pointing at the maps. We found it a few months ago. There's a small hive there, nothing too worrying so far. An autopsy on a dead one found quirk factor in its blood. So actually quirked. Unlike Kamakuras or Meganulin, said Izuku. Exactly. Aside from their size they can also manipulate their nectar, even to the point of forming solid objects. It's what their hive's made of. Okay, what am I looking for? Said Izuku. It seems to have some sort of early warning system for detecting threats, or in this case our team. We have footage here. Kenji pulled up several videos of their explorer teams tracking bees only to be suddenly noticed with no apparent cause. Izuku read the reports and frowned. It wasn't scent, they were downwind. It wasn't noise, there was no correlation between the noise they were making and the time the bees noticed them. Izuku watched the various videos closely, looking for any hints of why they might have been discovered at the points they were. Was it some sort of built-in radar? Some sort of detection quirk from a queen? Wait. Izuku watched the footage again. In each instance where the bees detected them the ground looked oddly shiny, like there was something reflective on it. The reports also noted an unusual sweet smell in the air at several points. Izuku grinned. Nectar. They're able to detect them with their nectar. In addition to controlling it, they must be able to sense it to some extent. And that means that Izuku began a mutter storm on the many implications or possibilities of this. Kenji and the others listened in and added a few ideas of their own. Within an hour, they'd filled in several gaps about the bees and had several new theories to test. After that they looked at a few other animals for a few hours until Izuku had to go. 
See you later Midoriya, said Kenji. You're welcome back anytime unless we're doing something classified, said another of them. Thanks guys, said Izuku. He walked out with two whole notebook pages newly filled with quirked animals and kaiju. Even he was tired after that. Izuku went back to his barracks, opened up Oda Murakami's biography, and began to reread a few more chapters before bed. In the next few days, things returned to normal. Izuku spent his spare time exercising, hanging out with the analysts, or reading his book. As for his team, they would train, drill, and do checkups on their tanks. They performed several simulated battles against Godzilla and other monsters and did fairly well in all of them, accomplishing most missions with minimal casualties, though they lost Yashiro's tank once. Afterwards everyone said Izuku was a lot more cautious in simulations than in reality, which was absolutely untrue. Okay maybe it was a little true. AMF Headquarters Commander Takabana stalked into the operating room. Various personnel moved aside as he marched toward a waiting technician at his sensor station. Report, Takabana said. Beacon Delta just detected a large object heading west in Sector 11, the technician said. Specifications. The technician read out his findings. The size, the speed, the heat, the radiation. It was him. He turned to his waiting officers. Deploy the first fleet along the safe zone border and have them ready to redirect. Hold a miracle mile of 4 kilometers. Find any uninhabited islands nearby in case he wants to go ashore. Chart his current heading and plan any dumping runs accordingly. The officers gave a chorus of yes sir, and hurried away. Takabana turned back to the viewing screen, watching the blip as it slowly moved across. Every year he had to do this. Every year it was crucial he not fail. The blip continued to move. Takabana clenched his fist. All right, let's walk this tightrope. The train shuddered, bumping Achako into the commuter next to her. She muttered an apology before turning back to her phone and typing another message. Me, anything happened yet? Midori, not for us. Some Kamakuras were seen migrating, but they're still out at sea. We are keeping an eye on them. Me, and the bigger ones. Midori, Anguirus was last seen swimming toward an abandoned atoll. A few weeks ago a fishing ship vanished near Guam. Ebera is believed to be the cause. Me, any response? Midori, yeah. The Americans sent the Saratoga after it. It's heading toward the safe zone. Command is letting the Americans handle it for now. They still have resources to spare. There was a brief pause. Then Midori continued typing. Midori, Godzilla was spotted by one of the beacons. They're worried how close to the border he is. They're going to redirect if he gets much closer. Achako nodded. After the disastrous 7th Battle of Tokyo, the AMF had for the most part switched its doctrine for Class 4 Kaiju and above from elimination to contain and repulse. To protect the mainland, the AMF had created a safe zone in the sea surrounding Japan. No Class 3 and above Kaiju that lived in the Pacific was to enter that hit. To maintain the safe zone, a series of powerful beacons were placed at strategic points to detect any approaching kaiju. The safe zone had held firm since before All Might. Still, Godzilla getting close was never a good thing. Even if he didn't cross, every moment spent trailing him was one they weren't dealing with the other giant monsters. In fact, several of her deployments against non-Godzilla kaiju had been precisely because they hadn't had the resources to stop them before they reached land. Me, okay, how are the other guys? Midori, Sakaki and Tichu Jimori are still here. They've both been promoted, but Sekaki's still in the field. Zenikairo's my driver now. Me, Sekizawa. The rookie. How is he? Midori, great. He's a good friend and great driver. Achako smiled. Me, I'm glad to hear it. And the others. Midori, dead or transferred. Achako sighed. That was to be expected. There was a reason G-Force gave you incredible pay and benefits that increased every year you stayed, and it wasn't for being safe. At three years, Achako had stayed longer than usual. Few lasted in the field as long as Midori. Doing so usually involved an obsession, a vendetta, or both, combined with a ton of luck and skill. Me, I understand. If Godzilla goes near a land mass, you be careful. Midori, aren't I always? Achako rolled her eyes. Me, I was your driver. Midori, Achako. Achako snickered. She could see his stricken expression. Midori, fine. You be careful too. Good luck. Me, thanks. Achako got off the train and walked home. She went inside and plopped on the couch. Mina was on the other side. Hey Chako, long day, said Mina. Yep, Setsuna and Kendo entered and got on the couch too. After a minute of them all sitting there together, Mina got up. I can see everyone here has had a long day, so I say this. She paused. Let's head to the bar and get drunk. A series of thumbs up answered her. An hour later Achkao was swigging a glass of warm sake. This is exactly what I needed. Thanks Mina. You're welcome Achako, said Mina. She took a sip of her own. 
This stuff, this stuff hits the spot. Yes, yeah, said Kendo, her cheeks rosy. It makes me think of stuff. Like what? Said Mina. Like how I much easier villains are than my sidekicks. I mean when sidekicks act badly, you gotta handle PR, discipline them. Be fair and figure out if you give them a second chance. And all that. With villains all you gotta do is slug them. It's so simple. Yes, yeah, said Mina. The only downside is all the paperwork. I mean I went to school so I could get to the punching and kicking parts. I didn't think I'd get more homework. I know right, said Ochako. I filled out fewer forms when I drove through a house. You drove through a house, said Satsuna. It was in my way, said Ochako, pointing a shaky finger at her. Maybe that's why she uses the train, said Ryaiko Yanagi, who'd been in the area and joined them. Seriously what did you do before getting your license? Said Mina. You once told me this gigantic bug I had to fight was small fry compared to what you dealt with. That was a fly, said Achako. It was a big fly. When you meet one that needs military grade weaponry to bring down, then we'll talk. Seriously, you met a bug that needed a machine gun to kill. Spooky, said Ryaiko. I heard about ones that are bigger than people. They once flooded a mine and began killing the men working there. The bodies looked like they'd been cut in half. Another of your ghost stories, Ryaiko, said Kendo. No, the scariest part was they were real. Ryaiko waved her fingers for emphasis. That'd be horrible, said Mina, shuddering. All you really need is a bazooka to blow them up, said Achako offhandedly. Or a tank. Don't you think that's kinda overkill, said Mina. Achako shrugged. Flamethrower then. Speaking of creepy crawlies, wanna know where my hero name came from? Said Mina, the alien queen from Aliens, a monster that bleeds acid. I like that movie, said Ryaiko. Suo, when it came time to pick names in high school I went with that. But Midnight shot me down. But here I am. Mina banged her glass on the table. All graduated when she can't stop me. Her tastes were weird anyway. I mean, alien queen is terrible but can't stop twinkling is okay. I even look like an alien. She gestured to her horns and eyes. But no, instead I had to call myself Pinky through high school. That's not that bad, said Kendo. Yeah, but it's not Alien Queen cool, said Mina. Fair enough. Ryaiko turned to Achako. Hey, you're Araka, I'm curious. Yeah, said Achako. Setsuna told me that you wanted to go to some charity event for kids bullied for their quirks. Why that specifically? Mostly because of a friend of mine, said Achako. He never developed a quirk of his own and was bullied for it as a kid. He didn't go into detail, but it sounded bad. They picked on him, belittled his dreams, and made him feel terrible about himself. I guess I want to help other kids from going through what he did. That's sweet, said Mina. Is your friend okay? Asked Kendo. Yeah, said Ochako. I first met him after high school. We worked together before I became a hero work. He's still at the old job. Is he that Midori guy you always text? Said Mina with a devious smile. Ochako narrowed her eyes. Yes he is, and no we're not dating. Rats, that's a good motive, said Ryaiko, ignoring Mina. Kendo nodded. You sound like a good friend. Even Mina said, glad your friend turned out fine. Let's have a toast. To fighting evil big or small. Achako raised her glass to that. X finished another circuit. He picked up a set of parts and began assembling the next portion according to the old man's blueprints. He had to admit, the original inventor of this device was a genius to have made it with the primitive implements of 200 years ago. The old man was smart too to have rediscovered it. Speaking of whom, X heard approaching footsteps. Is it coming along well? Said the professor. Yeah, it'll take a little while, but it will be ready, said X. Good. Even if the Meta Liberation Army fail their part, with this device we will accomplish our goals. Indeed, said X Meta Liberation Army. What idiots. Do they honestly believe the heroes will beat him? It's not unexpected, said the professor. They're even more obsessed with quirks than the rest of society. The moment they heard it lacked the quirk factor they assumed it was a mere animal. It's not our fault they didn't bother to check its true power. Or their own history. X chuckled. Oh to be a fly on the wall when they figure it out. His grin faded. What about the AMF? You really think this will get rid of them? I don't care, said the professor. They can't stop what's coming. Tokyo will burn, and no one can stop it. What happens to them is irrelevant to me. Not to worry Dr. Mifun. You'll get your revenge, said X the same monster all the regular people mocked you for focusing on will be the thing that kills them. Thanks to the same tech the AMF kept you from building too. Wonderful, isn't it? It will be beautiful, said Dr. Mifun. X imagined the cruel smile on his face. It was very much like his own. It will be. Izuku flipped backwards several chapters. He stopped for a moment to admire a photo of the monsters in action. They were terrible, yet in a strange way beautiful. Still reading that thing, said Kenji. Izuku nodded. Never gets old. 
Izuku turned back to the beginning, recounting Murakami's first encounter with Godzilla. Two men going head to head with the king of the monsters in a Sherman tank and surviving. Almost a decade later and it still gave him goosebumps. Well, Kenji said holding up some papers. If you get bored reading that for the hundredth time I found some accounts from a fishing village encounter with the big G in the 2030 seconds you might like. Found it while about researching old history. Izuku looked up from his book. That sounds great. Kenji smirked. Thought you'd like it. You know, Izuku, with your love of life and the dawn of quirks and pre-quirk eras, and my love of giant monsters, we'd make great historians. You'd need to quit monster hunting first and we both know you won't do that, said Kenji. True, said Izuku. Speaking of which, any idea what Godzilla's up to? You know with he tapped his temple. Kenji shook his head. I'm not my great-great-grandma. I've gotten better at reading him over the years, but I'm not connected like she was. Okay, said Izuku. I'll leave you to your reading, said Kenji. He set down his papers and walked away. Thanks Kenji, said Izuku. He picked up the article and began reading a fisherman's account of the fish suddenly fleeing their island. Yatsubashi held his predecessor's book as he gazed out over his mighty city. Soon another step would be made toward true liberation. Liberation from the shackles binding meta abilities. Liberation from the rule of the weak. Liberation for the strong. He went down to the information room where his cyber expert Skeptic was working. How is it going Skeptic? Any progress? Skeptic nodded. Not easy hacking this kind of network without being detected. But not too difficult either. They're clearly not expecting a cyber attack. I'm ready anytime. Yatsubashi pat his subordinate on the shoulder, good man. Would waiting another half hour be too difficult? I'd like to make sure our package is in position. Not at all redistro. Yatsubashi gave him a thumbs up. Good. Then we'll activate it in half an hour. What a waste. Adori took a look at the sea wondering why the heck the MLA sent them here. The orders didn't even make sense. They'd been ordered into the middle of the sea to wait a very specific amount of time. Just to dump some barrels. They were smugglers, not garbage disposal. Look at all the fish, said Yuasa as he stared over the railing. Adori ignored him, glancing instead at the deck where Mita was yelling at Kamatsu and Kudo for touching the barrels. Why had they been ordered not to touch them? Suspicious thoughts entered Adori's head. Was it toxic waste? But then, why wait to dump it? Was it a trap? Had the MLA found out about the bonuses his team had been giving themselves? These thoughts began to stew until Adori made a decision. He stepped down toward his men. Open them up. Nita turned to him. What? I said. Open them, said Adori. Kudo grabbed a crowbar and began prying open one of the barrels. The lid fell to the ground with a loud clang, leaving the contents of the barrel exposed. Kudo and Kamatsu slowly approached the open barrel top. Nita and Adori hung back, trying to see without getting too close. Kamatsu reached in and pulled out a bundle of tin foil. He pulled out a switch blade and cut the tin foil open to reveal a bunch of rocks. What could possibly be the point of them? He's turning. Now read Distro, asked Skeptic. Yatsubashi grinned. Now, Skeptic pressed the button. What was going on here? Commander Takabana's gaze darted around the room, trying to get a grasp on the situation. One moment everything was proceeding like normal, the next every screen in the room was going haywire. Sir, we've lost five beacons in the lower quadrant. The SGSs are offline. We've lost all trace of the target. Takabana's blood went cold. He turned to his nearest subordinate and said, Get a hold of the fleet. Tell them to scramble fighters, now. Sir, we've lost all contact with them, the subordinate replied. Even if we hadn't sir, he was underwater. If they're having the same problems we are, they won't find him. Takabana took a deep breath as he tried to figure out their next course of action. They'd lost all trace of their target. They'd lost all contact with their fleet. What could they do? The dark truth settled in. They could do nothing. Nothing but pray. Midori checked his watch. Half an hour to go. Maybe he should just dump the rocks now. Not like there was anything special about them. But what if this was a test? The MLA sometimes did that to weed out traitors. If it was, and they'd failed. The fish are gone. Adori turned to Yuasa. There were tons of them a minute ago, Yuasa said, but now they're gone. Who cares? Said Mita. We have bigger problems to deal with. Like, my hand. Adori turned to Kamatsu, who was clutching his hand, which now had a bright red burn on the palm. I didn't even touch anything hot, said Kamatsu. What's going on here? There was loud splash sound several hundred meters away. Yuasa rushed to the side. Is that a whale? Adori ignored him and focused on the situation, pushing back pit forming in his stomach. Kamatsu hadn't been handling anything hot. He hadn't handled the ropes. In fact, the only thing he'd done in the last half hour was when he'd opened the barrel. 
panic rising. Adori turned to his crew. Dump the load, he said. Dump it in. What the hell is that? Said Yuasa. Adori's gaze snapped over to see something moving beneath the waves. Something big. His breath hitched. What is thaw? The sea erupted in a flash of blinding blue light and searing heat. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 2. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author gfan97 on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.